Remember that APOE4 confers a large risk of Alzheimer's disease and APOE2 protects you against Alzheimer's disease. And, and but basically, if you look at the coding sequence variant in APOE, they influence the level of at least 62 proteins in plasma, which basically means that it is impossible or very dangerous to assume that the effect is mediated uh, through APOE. And I will come back to that a little bit later. But so, so basically, <coughs> even when you have coating sequence variant, it would be incredibly important to be able to do your proteomic studies in a hypothesis independent manner. It would be important to be able to scan the entire proteome in blood when you're looking for, for using proteomics to help you to bridge the gap we were talking about before. And we, there is no technology that go, takes you all the way there, but the somologic platform or the somoscan takes you uh, considerably in the direction of that. It allows you to assess the, the, the uh, level of about 5,000 proteins in plasma simultaneously in a large number of individuals. And the, the SOMASCAN is based on the use of, of single-stranded synthetic sin, sin, single stranded oligonucleotide aptamers that binds to, to proteins with high affinity. And, and when you're measuring the level, you're really measuring the level of, of, a, of the aptamers as reflecting the level of the proteins. And, and the SOMASCAN uh, contains about 5,000 aptamers that uh, evaluate the level of about 4,700 proteins. And, and when you look at the kinds of proteins that are assessed by the SOMASCAN, there is, a, there is a little bit of an overrepresentation of extracellular proteins, but that is really mostly because of, of the selection of proteins that have been put on the platform more than the representation of these proteins in blood because basically most proteins, intracellular as well as extracellular proteins, make it into blood eventually. We did a large study, and this is just a diagram of the way in which we did that study, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but we, we looked at the, the SOMA scan in about 35, 6,000 Icelanders. We have now expanded it up to about 60,000 individuals, and, and we basically uh, uh, measured or assessed the level of 4,700 proteins in 35,559 Icelanders, and we matched it with about 27 million sequence variants identified through sequence, whole genome sequencing in about 65,000 Icelanders. And basically 63% of the proteins correlate positively with age and about 18% of the negativity. And this is important to keep in mind because one of the things you get from looking at the proteome, in addition to be able to use it to help you to determine through which uh, gene a sequence variant uh, exerts its effect, but it also adds a temporal quality to your study because the proteins, they rise and they fall with a temporal relationship with an event, or they rise and they fall uh, with progression and regression of disease. And you could basically look at the the rise and the fall of these proteins as measuring the progress of life. 33% of uh, the proteins are at higher level in men than women, 23% at higher level in women. And we found about 18,000 Sentinel P2TLs, uh, or 18,000 correlations between variants and levels of proteins. And, and um, they assess the level of about 4,631 proteins. So 6% of the proteins measures, we, we could not find a variant in the genome that affects their level, but 94% we can. These uh, PQTLs are represented by about 5,000 sequence variants. If you consider, you know, variants being one, if there is a, a R square between them is, is greater than 8.80. And, and of the Sentinel P2TLs, 10% are, are in cis and 90% are in trans. Of the cis variants we discovered, 67% are novel and 96% of the trans variants are novel. 
And, and basically, when we are looking at the number of proteins per, per locus, about 75% of these uh, P2TLs or these variants uh, affect a level of one protein. About 22% of them affect a level of two to nine pro proteins and 3% involve 10 or more proteins. And 31% of them of the, of the two, P, of these, these sentinel variants are only in, have only effect in cis, 64% of them only in trans, and 5% of them both in cis and trans. There are there are genes close to 38 sentinel P2TLs with association with levels of at least 50 proteins. And the three that affect the largest number of proteins is a variant in the complement factor H that affects the level of 2000 protein, complement 4B in the HLA region 841, and, and the one by the ASGR1 affect 550 proteins. And out, out, of these, uh, out of these variants, there are only five of them that are rare. And, and you can just imagine you, yourself the complexity, and I can give you a, an example of that. We once discovered the variant, a uh, emissions variant in the AS, ASTA1, that, the, that is a loss, sort of loss of function or partial loss of function, that affects the level of 550 protein. That variant affects the risk of coronary artery disease. And the discovery of this variant, you know, brought us really no closer to figuring out how this variant affects the risk of the disease. One of the things that we also saw is that when we compare different tissues, that we found a strong correlation between the number of E2TLs in tissues and cis P2TLs in plasma that are in high LD with a cis E2TL that are present in that tissue indicating that probably most of the proteins in these tissues will eventually make it to, uh, to blood or plasma. When we started to look at association between levels of proteins in plasma and various phenotypes, we started out with 373 diseases, and we found about 257,490 associations between levels of proteins in plasma and uh, the probability or the risk of a disease. And 76% of them were the proteins that are not on the OLIC panels. And the reason I mentioned that is that people are frequently speculating on, on which of these two technologies to use. And I have great respect for the OLIC technology, but currently they have far too few proteins, only about 13 to 1500 proteins. So, so, they, so you're much farther from being able to explore without a direction when you are using the O-link panels than the, than the SOMA scan. And examples of associations we see is the N-terminal pro brain derived neuroreptic peptide levels in, in heart failure, it's dramatically increased factor eight in venous thromboembolism, serine protease one in type one diabetes and leptin in obesity. And what does it mean to find a correlation between level of protein and the existence of a disease? It could be a cause, it could be part, the protein could participate in the pathogenesis, it could be a consequence of a disease, and it could correlate with a disease risk factor without being a cause or a consequence. And, and we went to the DIVAS catalog and pulled out 45,334 variant trait associations. And of those 12 are in a high LD with at least one P2TL, 1,200 in cis, 5,000 in trans. And when you combine, when you combine the, the, the P2TL and the disease risk variant, you can use that to help you to determine what kind of a role the, the protein level plays in the disease. And let's take one example from colorectal cancer. There is a variant e, e, that confers an odds ratio of 1.3 of colorectal cancer that is close to the cardinal like 2 gene. And, and when we looked at this, people had postulated that the cardinal like 2 had an effect on, on, um, on the risk of uh, colorectal cancer by being an antagonist of bone morphogenetic protein. But there was no evidence of that. For example, 
there is no E2TL uh, uh, or, or coating sequence variant in, in LD with this risk variant that is close to the cardinal gene 2. But we demonstrated that this variant affects the level of cardinal gene 2 dramatically. It is the top cis p 2 tl So basically, the cardinal gene 2 is a BMP antagonist. It binds to BMP and prevents its interaction with a BMP receptor. And it is well documented that the DNR polyposis coli is caused by loss of function mutation in the BMP receptor gene 1A. So this is an example of where we took a, where we took a, a cancer risk variant and we sort of closed the loop in demonstrating how the variant affects the risk of the disease. A second example comes from the, the ACIP locus, uh, where the gene for the Arguti signaling protein is. And there's a variant there that affects the risk of, of skin cancer. It uh, affects spin, skin pigmentation. And the variant has an impact on, on, uh, on the ACIP RNA expression in skin. And it has a, has a dramatic effect on the level of ACIP in plasma. Another example of how you, we close the loop of the pathogenic role of a sequence variant when it comes to, uh, uh, in this case, a skin cancer. But very often, more often than not, when you look at correlation between level of protein in plasma or, or, or P2TL, the, the effect of the variant, the effect of the, the protein on or the, the protein level increase or decrease is probably a consequence of the disease rather than a cause. And the beta defense 4A is an interesting example of that. The beta defense is an antimicrobial protein. And, and when we look at psoriasis, there is, a, there is a, a significant correlation between the level of beta defense and psoriasis, and psoriasis increases the level by almost a whole standard deviation. The effect, if you take all of the sequence variants that have been reported to associate with psoriasis, when you put them together, they dramatically increase the risk of, or the, the level of, of defense. But when we take the seven variants that have been discovered, that we have found that the factor level of beta defense in 4A, they have no effect on the risk of psoriasis, so the conclusion is that the beta defensive uh, levels are increased as a consequence of the disease. And then the big question is, is that then, if you think about this in a clinical context, a use, useless discovery? I don't think so, because it is very important to have a good quantitative biomarker to look at as a measure of extent of disease and a response to treatment. And psoriasis is sort of a spotty the disease that can be difficult to quantify and it certainly would be important to be able to use a biomarker to assess the efficacy of drugs that are used to to um, to treat psoriasis back to the apoe that i mentioned before it's an interesting when you look at this graph that on the on the x-axis you have the apoe2 <coughs> allele on the y-axis the apoe4 and as you can see that there are several proteins in this, particularly the VPS, a 28-9, which is in, in decreased concentration in, in, in those who are APOE4 positive, and, and it is an increased concentration in APOE2. And so it basically follows what you would like to see if you were looking for a protein that in somehow mediated the effect of the alleles of APOE on the risk of Alzheimer's disease that it decreased in the context of APOE4 that predisposes to the disease and increased in the context of APOE2 that it protects against the same. And we were very excited by this, but, but when we took individuals and looked at the, or determined whether there was a correlation between VPS29 and Alzheimer's disease in the context of, of, of the same APOE haplotype, there is no correlation at all. So even though it looked tempting to begin with, we have so far failed to demonstrate a role of EPS 29 
in the mediation of, of the risk of, of, of Alzheimer's disease. But there's another locus, this MS4A locus, which has a, a cluster of genes with variant that associates with the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And the same variant affects the level of TREM2 both in plasma and, and in CSF. And the variant that increases the, the expression of the message and, and increases uh, uh, the level of TREM2 both in CSF and, and plasma is the variant that protects against Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the variant, the allele that decreases, uh, increases the risk of the disease. And we did the Mendelian randomization uh, analysis using TREM2 levels as exposure and Alzheimer's disease as a risk, uh, Alzheimer's disease risk as an outcome. We believe we have demonstrated that TREM2 plays a key role in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. And basically all of the effect of the MS4A locus seems to media, be mediated through TREM2. But, but when, you, when you look at the use of, of transcriptomics and proteomics to try to insert towards an understanding of how a variant in the genome uh, confer a risk of a disease, one of the difficulties we are grappling with is the tissue-specific uh, expression of the messages. Uh, because of the difficulties of, of getting biopsies, but still uh, there, is a, there is a mounting amount of data in, in public databases that allows you, like DTEX, that allows you to inst towards sufficient data to make sense of it. But let me give you one example of, of a disease where we have successfully applied the, these three uh, methods, the, the, genomic information, transcriptomic information, and proteomic information. And the disease in question is autoimmune thyroiditis, which is the most common autoimmune disease of man. And uh, we did a large genome association study. We pulled down 90 variants uh, that significantly associate with autoimmune thyroiditis. About 60 of them are, are novel. And the variant with the biggest effect is an intronic variant in FLT3, which confers an odds ratio of about 1.5. This variant also confer, associates with risk of other autoimmune diseases that are antibody positive. For some day, it, it associates with uh, the risk of antibody positive rheumatoid arthritis, but not antibody negative rheumatoid arthritis. And, and strangely enough, it also associates with risk of acute myelogenous leukemia, it confers an odds ratio of 1.9, and I will come back to it in a minute why that is somewhat important. Then we took this variant and we looked at it in the context of, of our transcriptomic data. We have done an RNA seq of about from blood from about 17,000 Icelanders, and we demonstrated that it introduces this variant introduces a cryptic splice site. It leads to a, an incorporation of, of intronic sequences in the message that leads to a stop coton, that leads to the generation of a truncated FLT3 lacking the kinase domain. So this is a loss of function variant in uh, the FLT3 gene. Then we looked at the impact of this variant on the plasma uh, proteome, and it affects the level of significant number of, of proteins. Most of them have something to do with immune function, but at the top of that list is the lichen for FLT3. So we took the sequence variant that associates and showed that we, we found the sequence variants that associate with risk of autoimmune thyroiditis. We showed this variant leads to the generation of a truncated message, a loss of function. We showed it associate with increased level of the lichen for the receptor that the FLT3 gene encodes. What is in, interesting, and, and we show we showed that it associates with the risk of uh, acute myelogenous leukemia, increases the risk or, or, or has an odds ratio of 1.9. That is particularly interesting because it has been well documented that there is a correlation between in gain of function mutation in the FLT3 gene and, and acute myelogenous leukemia. So here we have a loss of function mutation in a gene and a compensatory increase in the level of the lichen for the receptor encoded by the gene 
with a with with a loss of function mutation leads to a final outcome that is akin to a gain of function. So this is one example of of uh, how you can use the the data from variants in the sequence from the transcriptome and the proteome to explore a little bit the pathogenesis of a disease. But by using the, the, the proteomics, it helps us to find causal gene. We can, by looking at the, at the impact of sequence variants on risk of disease and, and also on level of proteins, can help you to determine whether a particular gene really plays a role in the pathogenesis of a disease. We can use the proteomics to bridge the gap between the genome and the clinical phenotype. It helps us to add a temporal quality to what you're doing because of the rise and the fall of the levels of proteins with a temporal relationship with an event or the progression of a disease. And, and adding the transcriptomics, as I said before, on the top of, of the and proteomics on the top of the genomics allows you to separate changes in protein levels that are causes from those that are consequences of disease. And, and I think it is very important to be able to study the proteomics in somewhat hypothesis independent manner. But if you then go back to this cascade from the genome to the clinical phenotype and the fact that it, ha it is definitely under significant environmental influences and, and basically if you we, if we look at the sort of definition of common complex disease that it is a disease that has both a genetic and environmental component to risk, we are making a lot of progress in discovering uh, and disentangling the genetic components, but it has proven more difficult to systematically examine the environmental components. But keep in mind that the functions and dysfunctions of the brain indirectly must contribute to the environmental components by compelling us to seek or avoid what is unhealthy. And therefore, one of the paths to understanding of the environmental component of the risk of common complex diseases in, in all organs lies to a better understanding of the function of the brain. And paradoxically, some of that may be accomplished with the use of genetic instruments. And, and so the brain, in my mind, is sort of central to our attempt to try to figure out the environmental component. And I think it is appropriate, since this lecture is in the sort of Richard Dahl series of lectures, uh, to uh, give you one example from from uh, smoking. So basically, if you're if you're if you in Iceland, uh, lung cancer really doesn't happen uh, in anyone except long term smokers. 97.5 percent of those who are diagnosed with lung cancer in Iceland have smoked for decades. It, that means that lung cancer in Iceland is a pure environmental disease. It doesn't happen without exposure to a specific specific environment. But we and others have discovered a lot of sequence variant that compel us to seek the environment that causes the disease. We have found variants in the sequence. If you have them, you're more likely to smoke. If you smoke and have them, you smoke more. And if you smoke and have them, it is more difficult for you to quit. So it is basically, it is basically clear that the distinction between the environmental contribution here and the genetic con contribution is somewhat unclear. But then you may argue that this is just a very specific example. The addiction is a sort of an extreme dysfunction or the kind of this uh, extreme dysfunction that drives you into, into dangerous environment. How about then the normal functions of the brain within parentheses like cognition? And it has it has been demonstrated very clearly that cognitive ability is linked to various life outcomes, such as uh, life expectancy, education, employment, compensation, personality, um, and all kinds of physical and and uh, mental disease. But but cognitive cognitive ability as both a general and specific con components. And the general component, the G factor, uh, basically exists because there are positive correlations between most measures of cognitive ability, 
he, he, and uh, therefore you can you can assume that the G factor is basically a quantification of our all purpose uh, problem solving capacity. But there are some variation in the cognitive tests of cognitive ability that need more specific component to shed light on it. And the verbal perceptual a rotational model of cognitive ability insists that there are two opposite poles that if you if you if you control or your condition on the G factor are negatively correlated with each other and these are the the verbal ability or verb, and, and the on one hand and the visual spatial ability on the other hand and what we did is that we took two measures of cognitive ability from the UK Biobank, the numeric memory test and the and and the pair matching test. Uh, the numeric memory test is is a test of of uh, verbal working memory, and the pair matching test is a test of of visual spatial working memory. And we generated polygenic score for these polar opposites of of cognitive function, and 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 we took on this uh, the polygenic scores. And we looked at them in our Icelandic data, and basically, the higher your score on uh, pi, on the polygon score for uh, for visual spatial uh, uh, ability, the higher is your BMI, the greater is your risk of 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 uh, all kinds of diseases that are, are linked to obesity. The blue color here is is marking the visual spatial ability. And, and the lower you score on measure of openness personality that is marked by artists on this graph. And remember, openness has been correlated with, crea with curiosity and creativity. And the less is your risk of all kinds of psychiatric diseases. If you then take the, the, the polygenic score for the polar opposite for the verbal ability, the higher you score, the less is your BMI, the less is your risk of all kinds of, of uh, diseases as associated with obesity. And uh, the higher you score on the measure of openness that is uh, correlated with curiosity and, and, um, and creativity. But it does not have an impact on your risk of, of psychiatric diseases unless you correct for G factor. And then the higher you score uh, on the verbal ability, the greater is your risk of schizophrenia and even other psychiatric diseases. So I insist that the way in which you think has a significant impact on your body composition, which has a significant impact on your risk of all kinds of diseases. So I believe that where you, how you score on the various components of, of a cognitive function, particularly on these two opposite poles, has a serious impact on your behavior. Your behavior has an impact on your body composition, and your body composition has an impact on the kinds of, of uh, diseases you develop. And at this point, I'm going to stop. And I want to emphasize that I ended this talk on discussion of the environmental components out of my respect for the late Richard Dahl, in whose name this lecture series is being developed. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Stephenson, also given that we challenged you with a limited time. So ordinarily at this point, we would be on a different kind of approach and we'd have questions being typed in, whereas now we're at the mercy of the full audience. But I'm going to initially hand over to my colleague who is going to kind of jointly uh, host the session, Michael Holmes, uh, who I know was keen to put a couple of questions to you. And then after that, potentially with the few minutes we have left, we could open up to uh, the wider audience. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. I guess one of the, my first question is, um, as you showed with your GWAS of the somologic protein, also when we look at um, proteins measured through the O-Link panel, the majority of SNPs that are identified are, are not in regions of the genome that directly encode the protein, so they were they were called trans PQTL. Yes. And as as a result, a lot of the analysis that we use rely heavily on these trans PQTL. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the reliability of using trans PQTL to drive analyses such as Mendelian randomization. It, it it is. Let's put it this way: there is a it is significantly more complicated to uh, use the proteins because. 
there is hardly a protein with level in plasma that does not correlate with the level of a very large number of other proteins. So you end up, you know, if, if any, when you're looking at variants in, in the sequence that affect the level of, of many proteins, you end up having a significant problem when you, when you begin to do principal component, you know, analysis, etc. So, so you basically have to tailor make your approach to each one of these things that you're looking at. You're not going to do this with any kind of a, a standard, you know, uh, machine like approach. Each one of these is going to call for a specific approach. That's absolutely correct. But but even though this is difficult, it is possible, and and um, we we are gradually de you know developing a significant number of of interesting studies coming out of this. That's great, thanks. And just a, a follow up question on that. Um, one of your early slides mentioned that the concentration of these proteins changes with age, and I was wondering whether you had had the opportunity to look at exploring whether the genetic architecture of these proteins also changes with age and therefore that might allow you to do for example multivariable MR using genetic instruments at different points in the age to look at effects. We, that we, are, we, are, we are in the process of, of, of analyzing this but it is, a, the, it, it is fairly complicated because I, I'll tell you almost all proteins, eh, almost all of the proteins in plasma eh, you have a level that is dependent on BMI. So when you're beginning to look at this change with age, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that you have somehow to correct for, for, the, for the age related changes in BMI. And what I think is, is, is particularly interesting, and I regret not having used that study, is that when you, when you begin to look at, you know, First of all, almost all of the proteins, except for 232 proteins, they, uh, they have a level that is positively correlated with BMI, all right? Yeah. So when you ask the question, you know, there's a, there's a large number of diseases, you know, non-fatty, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease, uh, heart failure, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, these are all of them uh, diseases that have an increased risk with increasing BMI, right? And what we did is that we took the polygenic score for BMI, corrected for BMI to determine whether it is really the BMI or the genetic predisposition to become obese that predisposes to the disease. And the genetic predisposition has no impact. It is purely the obesity. So guys, keep that in mind. <laughs> Eat carefully. <laughs> you know, but it is fascinating. It is just the body mass that is that is causing the disease. There is slight. There may be a slight exception in the case of type two diabetes. Uh, the polygenic score may may actually have a little bit of an impact on on the risk of, of type two diabetes, but that's relatively little and nothing in the case of other diseases. I see that uh, John Todd, uh, diabetes expert, sending a, a few uh, questions here. So he's asked, um, he says, great talk, thank you very much. He asks, do you think that serine protease 1 uh, in type 1 diabetes is causal or likely to be a consequence of type 1 diabetes? I think it is a consequence. I don't think it is causal. And And I say that you know, in an extraordinarily irresponsible fashion, because <laughs> I don't remember having looked at it, but I wouldn't be surprised if it would not be a, a consequence. But uh, I owe him an email. He sent me an email this morning, and in my response, I will give him a, a, a confirmed answer. He also asked about, um, you mentioned BMI, for example, and its impact. Um, he's asking maybe a related question about variation of protein levels by season, is that something you've explored in your uh, no, studies? We, we, we <laughs> that, that was a, in many ways is a is a is a good question. But once you begin to look at that, there are some extraordinary seasonal problem you have to look at as as you have you know you have the cold season, the flu season, 
you have seasons where you expect that certain proteins will rise in the fall. But what, when we when we are looking at fairly large number of people, many of these things disappear. We have looked at at the diurnal variation in proteins. We take a fairly large number of people and when you sample them e, e, over 24 hour period, and there are there are only in our material we only saw 29 proteins with diurnal variation, which surprised me because you have the diurnal variation in corticosteroids and corticosteroids are fairly sort of general transcriptional modifiers. So I would have expected to see more fluctuation, but we only saw in 29 proteins. And actually, when we we, we have done also a study of, of correlation between measurement with the O-link and with, uh, with the SOMA scan, and they are, they are fairly well correlated, actually. They are, I, I, that was a relief to see that. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I know that you and others will need to run away. So let's see if we can do a, a final quick couple of questions, which was uh, Cornelia van Dijn asks, uh, she says, a problem with complex disease genes that multiple diseases are associated. So APOE relates to Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease. Have you found a way to correct for that? What do you mean by correcting for that? Where's Cornelia? She might be able to join yeah, us. Yeah, what, what do you mean a question by over. correcting for that? I think and anybody, there she is. <laughs> and now you're on mute, all right? And I cannot le read lips. <laughs> not even from a highly intelligent. Oh, can we not unmute Cornelia? Oh, I don't think we can. Maybe we can't. Cornelia, you ah. are on mute. She can't. Well, yeah, I think it's because of the way the meeting is set up. Uh, um, as a presenter, so she should be able to unmute now. Okay, you could try again, Cornelia. Okay, I'm sorry for that, Karen, because I can, could not unmute myself. Yeah. They had to do it. So my, my question is, if you interpret your apolipoprotein in example, then the problem is APOE, of course, we also know it as a cardiovascular gene and a lipid-carrying gene uh, in the liver. So a struggle we had is disentangling uh, the effect that it may have on cardiovascular disease, which may be quite independent from the effect on uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So have you found, I guess you would have found earlier than us, a way to, to deal with that problem? How can we... If I, we I, I'm, the... not, I'm not ent entirely sure that I, I, I understand what problem you're talking about. Because these are these are relative these are sufficiently distinct diseases that it shouldn't become a big problem. Yeah, but if you are looking at your example of uh, the genes you gave, so for trend two it worked, but that yeah. we know is a specific Alzheimer's disease. Yes. But if you have a new protein, you don't know whether it's related to liver function or to uh, Alzheimer function. liver function or well that may be just ldl or hdl yeah but there is there is virtually uh, you know there's no correlation between ldl and the risk of of alzheimer's disease yeah. the, the people's old you know hypothesis people were concerned about the pc sk9 inhibitors that dramatically low lower ldl that that uh, it might increase the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but we have fairly convincing data uh, on people who have loss of function mutations in the PCSK9 gene, who actually have no increased risk of, of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and even have a life expectancy that is about 1.8 years longer on average uh, than in the average pop in the population. So I. I don't see that as a, as a problem at all, that these uh, variants can confer risk of two diseases if they are sufficiently distinct. So I know we we do have questions trickling in, but I know we have come to time and many colleagues will have meetings starting right now. So firstly, I just want to thank everybody who's joined us and also stuck with us and moved over to this other meeting. Um, thank you for doing that and apologies that that was needed. But most imp importantly, uh, our speaker today, Carrie Stephenson, thank you very much also for bearing with us, giving a fantastic lecture, which numerous of the attendees have commented on.
And I'm sorry that we've deprived everyone of an extra 10 minutes because I think we could have carried on for a long time. But anyway, anyway, thank you, everybody, and have a good afternoon.